they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We are all evil in some form or another. I'm not guilty. The dead won't buy me. It's the living you gotta worry about. Some, if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello, and welcome to the Bad Taste Crime Cast. I'm Vicky, And I'm Janelle. And we are back again with a great episode for you. It might be a little... I don't even know anymore. I was going to say, it might be a little more depressing than our last one, but I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, everything's pretty depressing right now, <laughs> no I matter <know>. what. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I hope everyone out there is staying safe and staying healthy If this is your first time listening, a special hello to you. But before we jump into the story, we are going to head over to the newsroom. So this week, our story comes from Australia. I actually... just a little little peek behind the curtain. Normally, when we are talking about news stories, I'll do sort of like a little, like a little write up almost. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't even do it with this one because it's so crazy to me. Have you ever heard of the cult called Universal Medicine? That sounds familiar. I and there's part of me that's like, I wonder if I have heard about this. I just don't even realize it. But in Australia, there is a cult called Universal Medicine. It's run by a man named Serge Benayan, who is like a very controversial figure. But um, a father uh, was in a battle to get custody of his daughter, who was a member of this universal medicine cult. So it took five years and he was able to get custody back. His daughter is only six years old. So she's currently, you know, at that young of an age, you're being indoctrinated with all of these um, beliefs that belong to whatever Mm -hmm. cult you're in. Right. Right. Yeah. So the reason I found this one so interesting is because uh, Universal Medicine has about 2,000 members worldwide, but it's got some really weird shit that they do. Um, One of the big ones that people (laughs) point to is a practice where women massage each other's breasts to help them connect with Mm. their bodies. Yeah, this does sound familiar. (laughs) Yeah. And they also have a diet, a specific diet that bans carrots, red apples, and potatoes in order to help followers burp out evil spirits. Wow. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They also have – it's – it's on some things you can only do motions in an anti-clockwise motion. So in this article, one of the things that they talk about, and I'll post up this article in our our show notes. One of the things they talk about is when this father finally got his daughter back and they started with his custody of her, he would be like making something on the stove and stirring it. And Mm -hmm. his daughter would get extremely upset because he was stirring it in a clockwise motion versus Mm -hmm. an anti-clockwise motion um and of course it's a (laughs) counterclockwise they call it anti-clockwise in australia apparently stupid australians (laughs) um but he that is funny what anti-clockwise call it anti-clockwise i'm like i know keep saying (laughs) anti-clockwise i know i thought you were just like trying to grasp at the word like no (laughs) counterclockwise no they refer to it multiple times as (laughs) anti-clockwise yeah oh my god (laughs) but the belief is that by not doing these things it would stop you from being reincarnated okay so that makes total sense 
<laughs> yeah. It's a little <laughs> fucked up. Um, Serge Benyayan says it has, he's been kind of regarded as somebody who has um, an indecent interest in young girls. Uh, hmm. So kind of your standard cult stuff. I mean, it's not a great place. But like I said, I'm going to post up this article. Definitely check it out. The story itself is crazy. I'm glad that this father was able to get his the custody of his daughter back because at least at six, you know, you have some time to undo the damage that's already been done. Yes. Yeah. Whereas I feel like if you were older, it's not as easy to kind of reverse yeah. that. Definitely. And yeah. to like, um, I mean, how much do you remember from being six? You know, like yes. there's just a certain amount of memory capacity that you have anyway. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish very good things for them. Hopefully she will grow up to be a well-adjusted adult. We can only hope if she gets proper help. So that's that. (laughs) Um, We're going to hop over to Netflix and Kill. Um, This week, we are talking about a documentary that was released earlier this year called Tell Me Who I Am. Uh, It is on Netflix. It's about twin brothers Alex and Marcus Lewis. They were incredibly close growing up. But when Alex gets into a motorcycle accident when he is 18 years old, he loses his memory. Marcus attempts to sort of like recreate these memories from their childhood while also rewriting their extensive trauma to leave it out. Uh, So Mm -hmm. he had just decided to not, you know, if he, his brother couldn't remember all of this trauma, he wasn't going to remind him. Um, Yeah. During their conversation in the documentary, it's revealed that the twins were not only sexually abused by their mother, but by their mother's friend and uh, friends in a pedophile network when they were 14. Alex actually learns of this for the first time during the documentary at age 54. And it's a very raw moment because the brothers have never talked about this until now. And Mm -hmm. they're talking about it on camera. Yeah. I thought this was incredibly interesting. It's really sad you know obviously abuse of sexual abuse of children is not great i don't think you need to be saying that but it's not good (laughs) but to only find out you know when you are 54 that that was happening is Mm -hmm. shocking and sad and it definitely this one made me really emotional um you've seen this right Janelle? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Um, It kind of, it's kind of interesting in terms of science and psychology and the, like the effects that, uh, that sort of nature and nurture have on somebody who has completely lost their memory. Yeah. So when you take out that, like the, the trauma, because I've talked before about trauma and inheriting trauma and how that affects you genetically and psychologically. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what would have happened if he never would have found out that that had happened to him, you know, like, does that change the, the generational trauma that you have? Does, will that take away the, um, you know, effects that it has on you, you know, not just psychologically, but also in a genetic response? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's a kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, mm-hmm. But also, yeah, it's just it's gut it's gut wrenching. Yeah. To have to watch somebody relive something that they actually can't even really remember. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like I said, it's really sad. I mean, you have to be prepared for a very emotional story. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's. You're right. I think the psychological implications are really interesting there. Um, and we've talked about genetic trauma on the on the show before, too, mm-hmm. and how that can really impact somebody's life. Anyway, check it out. It's called Tell Me Who I Am. It's on Netflix. <laughs> Worth a watch. It's a nice little like hour and a half, two hour bite, I think. This is 
that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for all listeners. What are we talking about today? Oh, yes. I remember now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you forget for real? <laughs> yeah. For a second. Oh, I my gosh. Look at my notes to Vicky, remind you myself. you this one. <laughs> I know. It is my pick. Mm-hmm. But um, this is definitely going to include some violence and some murder and yes, um, discussion and of uncomfortable topics. Judicial system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, is traumatizing in and of itself. Right. Yeah. So recently, federal executions have been in the news thanks to the U.S. penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana, resuming federal executions for the first time in almost two decades. This is kind of what I started looking at this. And there is a lot that goes into federal um, death penalty convictions and the way executions are carried out. And it's kind of a crazy history. It's very convoluted and, you know, lots of intricacies that not even a lot of lawyers understand. (laughs) Yeah. As we will find out. (laughs) Yeah. And so I kind of, I kind of wanted to look at some of these cases and a little bit of the history of the federal death penalty in the United States. Now, since the beginning of July, uh, 2020, three death row inmates have been executed. Daniel Lewis Lee, who is a white supremacist who murdered a family of three in 1999. Wesley Ira Perkey, who raped and murdered a 16-year-old Missouri girl in 2003, and Dustin Lee Honkin, who killed four adults and two kids in Iowa in 1993. There's a couple of reasons why there hadn't been any executions in 17 years. A lot of it comes down to execution methods. First, there's a determination when they're they're talking about execution methods. There's a determination that has to be made as to what method to use as the drugs for lethal injection have become incredibly difficult to obtain and medically speaking have become uh, ha- have started to be viewed as sort of dangerous and not great. Isn't there only one manufacturer for those currently? I believe so. I feel like- I feel like I read that somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. And they also, I don't know if you remember, like a few years ago, they actually sped up some of the, and it wasn't for federal executions, it was just for for state, but Mm -hmm. they kind of sped up the time frame for executions because their drugs were getting ready to expire. Yep. And I was like, I I remember thinking at the time, like, I don't really know how I feel about that, but whatever. It's all about that bottom dollar. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, But there is also a question of whether to use the procedure followed by federal execution methods or if they were to use what method um, the state in which the inmate was sentenced uses. So Mm -hmm. last year in 2019, United States Attorney General William Barr decided that instead of using the a three drug cocktail. Instead, they would use a single drug, pentobarbital, and allowed the executions to move forward. Now, of course, that wasn't the final word. Many death row inmates have attempted to challenge this in court on the grounds of cruel and unusual punishment. Pentobarbital is known to cause pulmonary embolism, I believe, and it actually mm-hmm. simulates the feeling of drowning. Yep. Which is in my eyes cruel and unusual punishment yeah (laughs) yeah and part of that three drug cocktail included basically something to put you to sleep before they actually injected the killing drug and to avoid some of that and even that wasn't uh totally foolproof i mean there were people who would have seizures and become very violent and i mean it's it's complicated. But like I said, the history of the federal death penalty is certainly an interesting one. As you would have assumed, much of the American justice system is heavily influenced by Britain, mm-hmm. our lovely parent country. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Ew to think about that. I know. Uh, of course, capital punishment back in colonial days was a very different thing from what it is now. The first recorded execution was that of a Spanish spy named Captain George Kendall in 1608. And 
after that, those colonists went bonkers and decided to follow what's called divine, moral, and martial laws, allowing death penalty things for, like, stealing grapes and killing chickens and trading with indigenous mm-hmm. people. Death. Yep. <laughs> The guidance for the death penalty wasn't even like a, um, at the time, a consistent thing from colony to colony either, where things like uh, striking one's mother or father or denying the true God in Massachusetts Bay Colony got you the death penalty sentence. Colonists. My God. (laughs) Um, Always ruin it for everybody else. (laughs) I know. Eventually, as the country developed, the government was able to put in place a unified federal system, which is authorized by the Department of Justice in conjunction with the United States Attorney offices. There was a period of time from like the 60s into the 80s where the federal death penalty wasn't used and even stopped. But Janelle's going to talk about that a little later. So we'll just skip Mm -hmm. over that for now. (laughs) Currently, there's about 60 or so inmates sitting on death row waiting for execution dates, all of which reside at the federal penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana, where every federal execution with some very special exceptions take place. A lot of that has to do with cost saving and the amount of money it takes to build a death row facility. Again, it's all about that bottom line. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take a look at one case where somebody was convicted of the federal death penalty. In this case, it's a man named Ronald Mikos. Now, Ronald Mikos was a 56-year-old podiatrist from Chicago who had practiced in the area for a while. That's right. We're talking podiatry. (laughs) Sounds sounds made up for a minute there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he did feet things. And podiatrists Ew. do everything. <laughs> Could you never say that again? He did feet things. I mean, it's true. <laughs> I, ain't I lying. know, but it automatically, it takes you to a fetish state of mind. <laughs> and then I get very confused. <laughs> Doesn't it make you wonder if there's like some podiatrists that get into it because they're just real into feet? Um, I don't wonder that. I a thousand percent know that. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like in the same way that part of me kind of assumes gyne- gynecologists get into gynecology because they're real into vagina. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's why I go to only a female doctor. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> not taking chances. Um, and podi- honestly, podiatrists they do everything from like so, like foot surgery for whatever mm-hmm. foot issues. It's not but just to- bunions, baby. <laughs> yeah, but to um like clipping toenails for people who are not able to clip their own whether they just don't which is crazy yeah i mean yeah they might not have the range of motion you know they might Mm -hmm. not be able to reach that far that's like a major thing with because you know i've done a little bit of work with like homeless people and uh they Mm -hmm. that's definitely like a lot of the people that I've encountered have had, like, diabetes or are wheelchair-bound, and they can't even do, like, basic stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. When when they get sent to the hospital, that's one thing that gets done is, like, they clip their nails. Not just mm-hmm. their toenails, like, their fingernails, everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, podiatry must not be a very lucrative business because... Mikos was not satisfied with the amount of money he was making and decided instead to scam for some extra dollars. You know, we love a good scammer. So he decided to bill Medicare for a ton of procedures that he never did. Uh, This lasted from approximately 1994 to 2002. However, it did not go unnoticed by authorities and his billing practices came under suspicion, triggering an administrative review that looked at a subset of submitted claims. The... Review body went to Mikos and requested that he provide them documentation supporting he had actually done the work that he was trying to submit claims for. And Mm -hmm. instead of coming clean at that point, which I feel like if he would have just come clean, then this whole thing would have had a very different outcome. (laughs) But no, he didn't. 
Migos allegedly provided fake and manufactured documents that supported his claim he had done these procedures. But not only did he fake these records, he also allegedly forged the signatures and statements of patients to provide the investigating body with statements from the patients to support his claims. So he is forging affidavits from uh, current and former patients to be like, yeah, he did this work. <sighs> Terrible. <laughs> After a bit of investigation, the administrative review body decided to refer the case to the U.S. Attorney's Office, which prompted a grand jury proceeding to get started. Now, the whole point of a grand jury is to have an anonymous group look at all of the evidence provided and decide whether or not there is enough evidence to charge a defendant with a crime or with multiple crimes. This includes interviewing witnesses, and in this case, seven of Miko's former and current patients. Most of the patients received subpoenas requesting their attendance at the hearing, but Mikos took it upon himself to contact each and every one of them <laughs> to try and persuade them not to testify. One of the patients contacted was a woman named Joyce Brannon, who had formerly been a patient of Mikos. Her testimony was scheduled for January of 2002, and all seemed to be moving forward as expected. Amigos knew that these witnesses would be his downfall, however, and shortly before the hearing, reached out to Brannon to plead with her not to testify, or that when she did testify, to claim that she just couldn't remember anything. Of course. Brannon was not persuaded, however, and said she would indeed be testifying to the truth, then, only three days before her appearance at the hearing, Joyce Brannon was found dead in her residence. It was determined that she had been shot six times at close range with a twenty two caliber weapon, and the, nice. sup the subpoena that she had been served was found literally laying next to her body. Oh, my God. <laughs> Highly suspicious. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> Upon further investigation, police were not able to find any shell casings at the scene, leading them to believe that a revolver had been used in the shooting. Because of her involvement in the Mikos grand jury, police began looking into Mikos, discovering that he owned a gun that could have fired the bullets. Now, they, they'd they actually discovered this fact a few weeks prior when police had been called to the residence of Mikos' girlfriend, and when they arrived, they learned that Mikos had uh, multiple firearms and ammunition, but was unable to provide them with a FOID card. And so... Uh, uh, FOID cards. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, you know what? This is a comedy of errors for real. It's like, dude, it's a, just no. <laughs> just crime the correct way. <laughs> exactly. So authorities removed the guns and ammunition from the home. And Mikos then went, had his FOID card renewed, and was able to go and retrieve the guns from the police. And instead of moving them back into the house, he moves them into a storage unit. So when Brennan turned up dead and they began looking into Mikos, they went to search the storage unit and they found everything else because they had a record of all of the guns that they had collected from the residents. They found everything else except for a 22 caliber Herbert Schmidt revolver. When they searched his car, they found a box of Remington 22 long rifle rounds with 20 shells missing, but they were never able to recover the revolver. There were also reports that a man matching Miko's description was seen around Brandon's residence about a week before her murder, and cell tower data backed up this claim, as well as him being there approximately one to two days before the murder. Although authorities were unable to find any blood, fingerprint, or DNA evidence at the scene, the grand jury found the motive opportunity sufficiently compelling and decided to add this to what became a, an extensive list of charges. Oh boy. <laughs> Get ready for this. Okay, I'm ready. In total, Migos was looking at 25 charges, including 14 counts of mail fraud, five counts of health case fraud, one count of obstruction of department proceedings, three counts of obstruction of grand jury proceedings, and one count of killing a federal witness to prevent her appearance before a federal grand jury. 
if there wasn't enough before, let's just add murder to the pile. God damn. <laughs> Right? Couldn't you just, like, take the hit? Why Why do you gotta murder people on top of it? I know. I know. And it's, again, like I said, if he would have just, in the beginning, been like, yeah, I'm defrauding the healthcare system, he probably um, would have had his license revoked and not been able to practice anymore, but he wouldn't be in jail. Yeah. You know? It's like... Why go to these extremes? Just fess up. It'll be easier. <laughs> I mean, there's an easy transition from podiatry to, like, being a nail technician or something. You know? You could still yeah. get all up in somebody's feet. <laughs> yeah. You can still touch Ew. feet all you want. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Become a shoe salesman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. The creepiest shoe salesman ever. <laughs> While all of those charges are terrible, the last one is a really important one here because, well, not only because it's murder, duh, but also because according to the opinion provided from United States versus Mikos, quote, as indicated by the government, witness tampering by means of murder is an offense potentially punishable by death contingent on the existence of certain statu- statutorily pre- prescribed mental culpability and aggravating factor requirements, end quote. So I, I like don't- how they called it tampering. <laughs> it's not tampering. Straight yeah. up death. <laughs> well, they do say tampering by means of murder. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like at that point, it's like the tampering is yeah. not even in in the frame of mind. <laughs> I know. Now, I didn't, um, I don't know why I didn't, didn't include the list of specific things, but there's a list of about, I think it's like 12 or 13 specific things that you can get a death penalty conviction for under federal statutes. So it's not mm-hmm. like... I feel like it's not as wide ranging as it is in the states. You have it has to be very specific things, but I think treason was on there for a while. I don't know that anyone's been put to death for treason at least in recent history. It's it's a weird thing. But the government was pretty quick to file a notice of intent to seek the death penalty and move forward with the case. But not before Mikos filed motions for the court to find the Federal Death Penalty Act of 1994 unconstitutional. That motion was also where I was able to get most of the information from this case from. You know I love a good legal document. Yes. (laughs) There's a lot of, like, legalese included in these arguments as to the unconstitutionality of the Federal Death Penalty. But most of it had to do with violating procedures, violating Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights, and the death penalty, generally speaking, being cruel and unusual punishment, which I'm like, uh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Ultimately, the court denied this request and allowed the case to continue. Following the trial in front of a jury of his peers, Ronald Mikos was found guilty of murder, fraud, obstruction of justice, attempting to influence a grand jury and witness tampering, and was sentenced to death. This was only the second time a federal court in Chicago had sentenced a defendant to the death penalty. So it's actually not a super common thing on the federal level, Mm -hmm. I think due in large part, again, to to having very specific qualifications to qualify. But even if you do get sentenced to a death penalty, it's not like it's going to happen even two years from now. I mean, it can take years for that to go through for a lot of reasons. And some of that has to do with appealing and some of that has to do with, like we were talking about earlier, with the, the drugs and expiration dates. And if there's complications in um, other areas of the United States judicial system or politically speaking, if there's some sort of conflict that can take a whole bunch of extra time. But that is the story of Ronald Mikos. I, um, kind of went a little bananas as I usually do with my cases. And I was like, I 
kind of wanted to examine that brief period, very brief period in our history, where people were actually saying that um, the death penalty was unconstitutional. <laughs> yeah, which so it's like I said at the beginning, the death penalty in the United States is something that's fraught with a lot of controversy. I will also say the United States uses is like one of the only Western countries that actually uses the death penalty at length. And I think we use it more than most Mm -hmm. other countries in the world. So we definitely do. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the information for this episode that I was looking at uh, is coming from the Marshall Project, which is a nonprofit journalistic review of criminal justice. And I just wanted Mm. to read their mission statement because I think that kind of helps you understand where they're coming at. Yeah. The Marshall Project is a nonpartisan nonprofit news organization that seeks to create and sustain a sense of national urgency about the U.S. criminal justice system. We achieve this through award-winning journalism, partnerships with other news outlets, and public forums. In all of our work, we strive to educate and enlarge the audience of people who care about the state of criminal justice. So I think that kind of helps. Uh, it's, be, you know, it's peer review, which means people are constantly doing research and, and reviewing things yeah. with each other. So I also got a lot of information through various college law institutions and a whole bunch of articles off of JSTOR, which if you are in graduate school, that is like, what you spend 90% of your time on looking up articles to do research and review and write papers. <laughs> so shout out to NIU for my JSTOR account. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I'm going to be looking at the Furman v. Georgia case. This is going to incorporate a couple other cases as well, because this is going to be a, a Supreme Court kind of ruling. So we're going to talk a little bit about the actual case, but mostly it's going to be about the implications of what it meant for the death penalty. So on August 11th of 1967, William Joseph, and I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Mickey, but don't quote me 100%. uh, (laughs) William Joseph Mickey Jr., his wife and five kids were home asleep. At around 2 a.m., William heard a noise in his kitchen, thinking it was one of his kids he went to investigate. He instead found William Furman, age 26, attempting to rob his home. Furman began to flee and in doing so shot Mickey in the chest. Mickey died as a result of the gunshot wound. The police were contacted and within minutes, Furman was located in the neighborhood still carrying the gun. Um, And that seems like a pretty cut and dry like case. You know, he broke in. Shot the guy, got startled, yada, yada, yada. Pretty straightforward. But as it, but as it were, it is not cut and dry. Of course not. And this would unravel uh, complicated intricacies of the death penalty. Um, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, right. So the, tr- yeah. So the trial was actually in September of 1968. And because Furman had no money, he received a court appointed lawyer. He stated at the trial he began to flee and tripped, causing, and it caused the gun to go off. So, you saying it was kind of like an accidental thing. Okay. Now, this did contradict his statement to the police right after the crime, seemingly. All that he stated was that he had shot him, and that was it. So, it's this is where it's a little bit fuzzy in the case, because he did say to the police that he shot them, but he didn't say anything else. So, that could be, you know... Yeah. Yes, I did shot him, but it was accidental, or yes, I did... I shot him. Like, so, there is, you know... Well, a gray area there. It's one of those things, too, when you're looking um, or when you're talking about intent, the fact that he went there with a weapon is almost enough mm-hmm. to be like he planned to use that weapon. Intent right? harm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So not only did he testify this, his lawyer also had him take the stand and put in an insanity plea because he was at the same mental level as a sixth grader. So they're trying to, like, pull out everything they possibly can to get him off. Okay. The trial lasted only one day. Wow. And the jury found him guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to death. Now, this seems very extreme to me, correct? Wow. But you could be put to death in Georgia for one single murder. And there's also, as you had mentioned, a couple other different ways that you could be put on death row. One Mm. of them being rape which actually surprised the shit out of me with the way that we 
don't prosecute or investigate rape cases, the fact that rape could be, you know, one way to get the death penalty was kind of a shock. Yeah. So Furman appealed his conviction and a stay of execution was granted as he attempted to bring his case before the Supreme Court in Georgia. Now, he was eventually successful, but first, he, when he took it to Georgia Supreme Court, the conviction stayed. So they uh, proceeded to take it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, this is where the historic discourse took place, and eventually, you know, he had success. Now, there were two additional cases that I had mentioned before that were included in the Furman v. Georgia in this sort of discussion of constitutionality of the death penalty. And those cases were Jackson v. Georgia and Branch v. Texas. Now, the cases that were included were both convictions of rape, and they were sentenced to death. So this is why I really found this interesting is because they kind of – this doesn't happen normally. They don't just, like, slosh a bunch of cases together in a Supreme Court decision. Generally speaking, they hear everything individually. So this case is very unusual. Yeah, Now, the basis for the Supreme Court argument is the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. And they also kind of were arguing whether or not juries actually understand the extent of death penalty and its applications. Okay. Um, So they're kind of looking at it in a twofold process. Now, in 1972, with a five to four decision, the Supreme Court reversed Furman's conviction. Five of the justices agreed that Furman's death sentence was cruel and unusual punishment. The Supreme Court granted, and I cannot say this correctly, a seratorari, which just means that, yeah, which just means <laughs> that they agreed to hear the case. Yeah. Now, they her- agreed to hear this case, and they limit it to, you know, they wanted to limit the scope of this to one question, and it was whether imposing and carrying out the death penalty in these cases violated the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment, as applied to the states by the due process clause, which is described in the Constitution as deprived of life, liberty, or the property without due process of law. That's what that kind of encompasses. Okay. And they were looking at that as applied due processes clause of the 14th Amendment, which, if you're not familiar with the 14th Amendment, specifically states the rights of a U.S. citizen. In a per curiam opinion, which is just fancy Latin for the court's opinion, (laughs) the court held that it would, finding that the death penalty was unconstitutional when applied in an arbitrary or discriminatory manner. The court found that the death penalty was applied in a manner that disproportionately harmed minorities and the poor. In concurring opinions, Justices Brennan and Marshall argued that the death penalty was unconstitutional under any circumstances, as less severe punishment would serve the same punitive goals. Interesting. Okay. Yes. So they hinged their arguments on that arbitrariness that kept coming up. If you read the um, the discourse in full, you hear the word arbitrary mentioned a lot. Mm-hmm. Now, arbitrary is what would actually make this decision be struck down again, and the death penalty ruling would be eventually overturned again. But each justice stated their own opinion on the arbitrariness, and a few focused on racism, some focused on the failure of states to condemn only the quote-unquote worst criminals, and other justices focused on the infrequency with which the death penalty was employed. So again, bringing aspects of racism, but kind of just inconsistency in the law overall. Yeah. However, no one stated precisely how much arbitrariness violates the Constitution, and that's why it eventually got overturned. Like, what degree of arbitrariness actually violates the Constitution? Now, Justice Douglas reviewed the history of the death penalty in England and in America and noted that under English law, the death penalty was unfair if it was applied unevenly to minority groups. Douglas then stated that the death penalty in the United States is unusual under the Eighth Amendment if it discriminates against a defendant because of his race, religion, wealth, social position, or class. Douglas then reviewed studies on how the death penalty was applied in America, and it was concluded that African Americans, the poor, sick, and uneducated members of society receive the death penalty more often. Douglas believed this happened because juries had no guidance when applying the death penalty, and this allowed juries to act on their prejudices by targeting unpopular groups with the death penalty. Okay. 
So, you know, normally when you pick a jury, you want to pick a jury that doesn't have biases or prejudices, but that's absolutely impossible. Yeah. <laughs> because everybody has a bias or a prejudice ingrained in them um, at some point in their life. So, yeah, you know, it's arbitrary. Yeah. The ruling of this case, to be clear, did not outright make the death penalty illegal. And this is where people get confused about it. It instead challenged those who decided to continue to use it to avoid the arbitrariness of the death penalty. While it did stop people from being executed and put onto death row, it didn't actually outright say that it was unconstitutional and taken away. That's where there's a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. The immediate impact of this case is that several death penalty sentences were communicated to life in prison. A few people's sentences were even reduced to just a few more years in prison. And actually, Furman was released in 1984 due to this decision. Yeah. So this case forced states to re-examine their death penalty guidelines. Most others rewrote their guidelines, but the new laws created a two-phase system for death penalty cases. In the first phase, the jury decided if the defendant is guilty of murder. And then in the second phase, the jury hears new evidence to decide if the defendant deserves the death penalty. So this is what we commonly practice now. The new laws gave juries guidance for making this decision. But again, not a whole lot of guidance. In 1976, in the Greg v. Georgia case, they basically reversed their own opinions on the matter. And if changes were made that the death penalty could be constitutional. So this is, again, everybody started rewriting the, their views on the death penalty per state. So they were already kind of gearing up for this kind of like challenge to the constitutionality of it. Gotcha. Now, arbitrariness, as it is stated, is still a rampant problem. And we see people being released from death row for crimes that they did not commit pretty regularly. I mean, if you just take a stroll over to the, you know, freaking Innocence Project webpage, you can see uh, all of the issues that <laughs> the death penalty still has. Mm -hmm. um, we are still seeing disproportionately black and poor peoples being sentenced to the death penalty. There has been a downward trend of using the death penalty in sentencing. So I'm going to throw some statistics at you. More than 300 annually in 1995 compared to 73 in 2015. So you can see that's a significant drop. Yeah. Now, this is the death sentencing rate. So not necessarily the people who are executed, but put, you know, sentenced to it. Prior to Furman, the American death penalty was largely a Southern phenomenon. Between 1930 and 1967, of the 3,859 executions carried out in the United States, 2,306, or 59.7%, occurred in the South. That is not surprising in the least. <laughs> yes. So since Greg, the American death penalty has become almost exclusively a Southern phenomenon. Of the 1,429 executions conducted in the United States since 1976, 1,163, which is 81.3%, have been carried out by southern states. The three most active death penalty states are Texas, Oklahoma, and Virginia. And they have been responsible for 52.9% of executions since 1976. Now, Texas by itself accounts for 37.6% of the total. That's absolutely insane. And I mean, everything lot. is bigger in Texas, you know? I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> of the 28 executions carried out in 2015, 13 occurred in Texas. Now, that doesn't sound significant, but if you put the rest of those across, like, one to two in each state, that is, mm -hmm. you know, astronomical in comparison. Yeah. It's not because all the most violent crimes and criminals happen in the South, but I believe instead that it has more to do with the culture of those particular areas and the institutional racism. Now, a study found that rural areas, which this is very interesting, use the death penalty more than cities. Now, you think about those kind of angry torch-carrying mobs. Um, and just to clarify, the study did include various regions of the United States, but this kind of uh, speaks to the overt use in the South because it's predominantly happening in the South in areas that are rural, not necessarily their larger cities. Yeah. Now there is still little to no guidance for jurors in the death penalty and actually capital attorneys are not even required to have additional training for the death penalty. Yeah. 
when you couple uneducated jurors with biases, attorneys lacking training, and a system founded on racism, you have the perfect storm. And that is why the death penalty is unconstitutional in its basis, because of all of these encumbering factors that, you know, we just, we can't put people to death without having, you know, we, we are biased. We are biased. Everything that we are founded on is biased. Um, mm-hmm. So we can't, I mean, consciously put people to death because of that. We we carry too much of that bias, not just within ourselves as individuals, but within the system in and of itself. So that argument is very interesting. Um, it still continues today, the constitutionality of the death penalty. And we have significantly reduced the amount in which we use it. And also because of DNA, people are getting off of death row at mm-hmm. alarmingly high rates because yeah. of just the lack of police work, the the shittiness of our judicial system. It's just, it's like we need like an overhaul or something. <laughs> yeah, I, it's one of these things, and I'm sure I've said this on, on the show before, Personally, I am against having the death penalty, and it's due in large part to us not having a perfect system. Uh, we mm-hmm. send a lot of innocent people to jail and give them the death penalty or life in prison for things that they have not done. Like you said, now there's people getting off who have been in prison for like 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm who now all of a sudden are being found out to be innocent. And because of that, I just cannot endorse something like that at all. Exactly. I will say, because I was curious, because of course, we're talking. when you think of death penalty, I think most people think about the South. Mm-hmm. And I was curious as to um, the makeup of states that still have the death penalty. And most of them are still in the South. Yep. There is 28 states that still hold uh, the right to retain the death penalty in addition to the U.S. government, the U.S. military. Just to give you a quick rundown, if it's in your state, maybe you should like write your legislators. But um, <laughs> those states are Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Virginia, and Wyoming. That Very... sounds almost like all of them. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's it's a lot. And you, I was going to say, you notice from this list, these are a lot of states that have a lot of things in common as far as the makeup of the population. I would say probably the political leanings generally of the state. I there's uh, I, I, it's just one of these things that I'm not a big fan of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I w- I wish uh, we didn't do it ever <laughs> because <laughs> it's very much abused. It is. It is wholly abused, and I also agree with you. I I don't believe in the death penalty. Yeah, um, because there are so many factors that we can never ever account for there are biases not just within people but within the system but also the fact that you have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt and Mm -hmm. for me doubt is everywhere right unless there is in in, in, even in cases with dna evidence that can still be tampered with and that still can be misused and that still can be tested incorrectly so Mm -hmm. for me Beyond a reasonable doubt, you you can never really truly prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. That's just my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think there's just a lack of education. Like you said, lack of education for juries, mm-hmm. not only for their own. We don't even have, we don't even have basic understandings of like. Yeah local law how could we have basic understanding like a lot of people don't even know understand the intricacies of voting rights so how are Mm -hmm. we going to understand the intricacies of an entire justice system (laughs) yeah and a lot of times uh when you're talking about death penalty cases it almost hinges on one one charge where if it's like one charge up you're death penalty qualified and one charge down, you're not. And mm-hmm. I just generally speaking, think juries have a lack of understanding of 
law and where where and when to apply it and how to apply it and Mm -hmm. then to be asked to determine if the death penalty is inappropriate i mean they talk about when you go into a case where death penalty may be on the table you have to get a death penalty qualified jury which means you have to have a jury of people who are open to the idea of convicting somebody to the death penalty so like some people like you and me would probably Mm -hmm. not be approved well for other reasons also but we would not be on those juries (laughs) (laughs) they definitely would not want us on the juries because we know way too fucking much (laughs) yeah we would and that's the other thing like it's it's very game like when they are selecting jurors and also when it comes to making deals like Mm -hmm. it is about numbers and it is about dollars and you know all of these deals and all of these jury selections and just like the way that we exchange evidence and things it it creates just an even deeper problem beyond just the scope of what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. There is, we could honestly go on for hours. We could have a about, whole podcast about this. <laughs> yeah. About, um, this was just the federal death penalty. I mean, that's not mm-hmm. even getting into states, what various states do yes. and various methods. States do not all have the same method of execution. No. I mean, it's it's a lot. There's a lot to cover. But I think this is a nice little intro looking into the federal death penalty. I will say, I know you mentioned the Marshall Project, which is mm-hmm. a great resource for basically anything criminal justice related. They are they are awesome. Yes. They're very much in the same vein as the Innocence Project with the work that they do. Yeah. So. Yeah. They do a great job over there. But I also wanted to, if you want to know specifically more about the death penalty, to check out Death Penalty Information Center at deathpenaltyinfo.org. They have done a fantastic job of compiling a lot of data and resources regarding the history of the death penalty and the way it's used and a lot if you're a data junkie it's like a great place to go mm-hmm. and we will I'm, link both- i'm dadded out right now <laughs> i know uh, we will Between link both this of those in school. the show notes <laughs> so much data data and like all the data graphs <laughs> charts i see them when my eyes are closed <laughs> well janelle if you need a break from that data maybe you should uh check out this podcast hello this is margo p and this is Margo D. And we are the Margos. We are the Margos, <laughs> co-hosts of the Book versus Movie podcast. We are the podcast that talks about films that are adapted from books. We read the book, we watch the movie, and then we decide which we like better, the book or the movie. Now I know what you guys are going to say. Duh, the book is always better than the movie. To which we always reply, have you ever read have you Jaws? Read Jaws? <laughs> we are not film experts or literary geniuses. Nope, we're just two friends who like to chat about books and movies. We really like to go for a deep dive into the history of the book and the background of the author and the trivia from the movie set. And most of all, we just like to have fun, so we never take ourselves or the books or movies too seriously. You can find us wherever you sign up for your podcast under the name Book vs. Movie. And on social media, you can find us at Book vs. and Movies. You just spell it all out. Hope you check us out soon. All right, guys, that has been it for our show this week. Thanks so much for joining us. We do have one big event coming up very soon. <laughs> one sole event. Just one. <laughs> it's, the, it's literally the only one that we've been able to look forward to since, like, February or March. <laughs> yeah, we had, let's see, we had the True Crime Festival canceled. We had mm-hmm. uh, the True Crime Expo canceled for the second time. I mean, yep. We were we were a zero for three there for a second, um, but yeah. luckily, the wonderful people at the Elgin Fringe Festival decided the show must, in fact, go on, Yay! and so we will be doing it virtually. Um, if you head on over to elginfringefestival.com, you can find out all the information for all of the shows, not just ours. It is a month-long virtual extravaganza with lots of surprises for you. But you can purchase uh, tickets just for one show, or you can purchase a pass, and you can see all of them. Um, You will be able to watch them at your own leisure time. This isn't going to be like fully live, where you have to tune in an exact time. So I think that's a really great benefit of doing it virtually in this manner, is that you can watch it on your own time. And you can have an 
and sit with it for a little bit. You know, it's not like immediate. So yeah. again, check out elginfringevessel.com. We are on there. There's going to be another podcast about paranormal on there. There's going to be all kinds of comedians and, and wonderful storytellers stuff. and music. It's going to be amazing. So definitely check it out. Yeah. And if you don't live in like the Northern Illinois area, this is going to be a great opportunity for you guys to check us out in person, virtually, of course, Um, because we can't (laughs) necessarily go do a fun tour and shows in all the states because we broke. But yeah, (laughs) as much as we want to, I think this is great um, if you don't live near us to check us out. So so check it out. (laughs) (laughs) Um. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find more just like this at badtastecrimecast.com, where you will also find uh, links to get merch if you want. We got bags and t-shirts and like notebooks, I think, and some other stuff there. It's all good. It's all cool stuff. You can also find our donate page there where you can join our Patreon if you want some extra bonus content. Which there's a ton of stuff up there, and there's some stuff coming down the yeah. pipeline, I think. Oh, Maybe. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had to take a little break because COVID, but we're, yeah. we're on it. <laughs> yeah. Because 2020 interrupted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, and also, too, we took some time to do a little bit of action on our YouTube. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you can go on over to our YouTube page. I should add that to the website, too. Um, mm-hmm. You can go on over to our YouTube page where, from this point forward, all of our episodes will be posted. I'm working on getting the backlog episodes up there. I can almost guarantee by the time this goes out, I will have not finished. It's a process. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That is not the way I thought that was going to go. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It will it will not be done, probably. It's it's a bit of a process, and it just takes some time because, you know, uploading and downloading and internet technology things. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you can head on over there. Uh, we've got some live streams that are up. We've got a great interview with Cider Scene is up there. Just a ton of fun stuff to keep you busy while you sit at home. Instead of going to a packed <laughs> bar, have a drink and watch us. <laughs> yeah. Be your own uh, bar. That's the 2020 motto. Bar. <laughs> be your own bar. Well, on that note, I think that's all we got for you this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our sound and editing is by Tiff Fullman. Our music is by Jason Zakshowski, the Enigma. <laughs> That has been our show. Hope you guys stay safe and stay healthy. And we will yeah, see you in two weeks. Yeah, mask up and s- stop coughing on people. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, let's end the show with that. Please, for the love of God, wear a mask. Yeah. We will see you I in two weeks. I don't want to stay at home <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> as if a wave of evil washed over this town. We are all evil in some form or another. Uh, for real, though. Just wear a fucking mask. For real.